take a picture of us, Bill? I'll yeah. give you five bucks. Nah, oh, no. damn, that's a great deal. Oh, I get like 50%, yeah. bro. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, brother. Good to see you, brother. Awesome, Absolutely. What's up, man? You doing all right? everywhere so if you know Delaware do that virtually bro. yeah for sure I mean, I mean that's where I grew up mm -hmm. so it's like I knew that I knew that situation but, but, uh, so just growing up I was like you might as well utilize that have to yeah so now and in all your videos man it's like I ain't what they guys doing they got yeah me neither man when I seen that first video you say you lost your you was just that last the last bit that was it first, first house was the 14k I was mm -hmm. like man it's possible yeah you mind if I can ask for a picture man? yeah yeah let's do it yeah. hell yeah let's do it Appreciate you guys. Man, sure, man. Yeah. Cool, man. man. Absolutely, brother. Good meeting you, man. Keep, keep going, brother. Appreciate you, man. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Um, Y'all want to go to the back? Because our next speaker, when it comes to social media, is another power player. You probably know where I'm going with this one, don't you? Thank you, bro. Who knows where I'm going with this? Right? You know, this gentleman and I just chatted backstage in 2015. He moved back into his mom's basement at 30 years old. And since then, he's like, I don't like to really drop the number. Drop it. Million dollars a year in his whole ecosystem of earnings. Tell you why this is amazing. First of all, about 2017, I sat about right there on a round table, about right there. And you know, as I speak to all the speakers and the, and the people here, one thing that we most of us have in common is we all attended some Sean Terry event to get us a launch. So I believe in giving people their flowers while they're still here. So I want y'all to give a round of applause for Sean Terry. Also, give a round of applause for the All In team. Because I put on events as well, and these are not easy. So it's been, it's, I'm sure it's been great for everybody. And am I, am I the last one? Am I like, all right, cool. Don't fall asleep on me. All right, you guys have a seat. Love you too. So if you guys came here to get some real estate advice from me, I'm sorry you can get up and leave now. Right, but let me tell you my story before I get started. So most of you guys know you heard him say that in 2015 I had to move back with my mom at 30 years old. 
Well, kind of before that, at 17 years old, and even before that, I'm the first generation American born to Jamaican parents. There goes, you count on Elijah for a gunshot every now and then. My Trini Jew friend over there, love him. So, you know, the odds were stacked against us. Born in New York, moved to North Carolina in like 1993, went to elementary, middle school, high school. Shout out to my guy Chris Paul putting the, you know, putting the Phoenix Suns in the, in the playoffs. But anyways, as we, as I get to this point here, I, I, I'm, like, I'm a terrible student. I mean, how many terrible students did you guys have in here? I mean, like, real bad. Like, I did not have a 2.0 GPA. Yeah, I, okay, nobody, right? That bad. So I knew I wasn't going to college. I could barely play sports the whole season because as soon as the report cards came out, uh-uh, you need a 2.0 to play. So I knew I wasn't going to be going to school for, for it, playing football. I couldn't get into any colleges based on academics. So what I do? Well, everybody does. You go to the military. <laughs> so I went to the United States Air Force. And it was fun. Met some great people, learned some lessons. But one thing that I learned is integrity. Integrity first is probably the biggest thing I will take away from being a United States Air Force. But you know, getting shot at is really not that fun. How many of you guys have been shot at? No, don't, don't raise your hand, I'm just joking. Oh shit, you getting shot at, okay, that's what I'm talking about. So getting shot at is really not that fun, so I knew I wanted to get out. And towards my third year, I was like, you know what? This entrepreneur vibe, I gotta do something. So I get out and I start my first company, a lawn care business. <laughs> I could put some good stripes in the grass, believe it or not. But I moved on and I got my real estate license. It started out pretty decent, you know, selling decent homes and not really knowing anything about real estate. And then the crash happened. And then I thought, you know, at that time, I think I was like 24, 23, my life was over. Financial crisis was happening. So I got up and I just left. Gave up real estate, moved to California, moved everywhere, just all over the place, kind of like a nomad. And got a corporate job doing marketing and stuff like that. And around 2015, I just quit. I was like, here I am back again in my cycle of not being happy. So I just got up and quit. I said, you know what? I got a bright idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna create an app. I ain't got no money. So I raised $60,000 and at that time I thought it was the, the craziest amount of money. But guess what, the app failed. It wasn't nearly enough. So at this point, I left home at 17. And now I'm 30 years old and I remember on Thanksgiving I have to ask my mother, can I move back home? Whew. How many of you guys got immigrant parents? Raise your hand. All right, so you know what I'm about to say. I'm 30 going back home, but I'm 17 again when I get in the house, right? You got to eat when she says eat. Ain't no girls coming over, not happening. And so at this point, I'm like, listen, I got to change my life. I got to do something. I have to do something. And I felt, I, I'll be honest, this was probably the worst time of my life. I was depressed. I was spending probably 23 hours in the room, one hour, like I was in prison. I would only come out to eat. And I felt depressed, and I know many of us go through depression, but I said, I have to do something. My good friend, Coach Lynn said, when they buried you, they did not know you were a seed. And so through that, I had a friend who had a dad that was a millionaire, and I didn't know why he was a millionaire. We just always knew he had money. And so he went to his house one day and he said he's in real estate. And he shows us all of the properties that he owned. I'm like, how is this possible? How is this guy that's a 22 year army veteran, black guy looks like me, how is he rich? It doesn't even make any sense. How can he do this and I can't? And he mentioned the word wholesaling. So I went home and I started typing up wholesaling. And guess who pops up? Sean Terry. So I start watching Sean Terry's content on YouTube and going over to Wholesaling Inc. and watching the, listen to the podcast, and I became obsessed. How many of you guys have been obsessed with something? Like when you stalk that girl that you like but doesn't like you back, that type of obsess. That was me. That was me in wholesaling. And so I became obsessed with wholesaling, and it was just, I, I don't know, I, it was something that I just couldn't hold back. I wanted it, and I knew I can do it. So after 
spending three weeks in my room, listening to Sean Terry, literally when I'm sleeping, while I'm waking, cutting the grass, every single moment, I mean completely obsessed, I go out, I'm, I'm really broke at this point, guys, I'm really broke, like a few dollars, no joke. Bank of America, I have a 2004 Volkswagen Jetta at the time. I don't know if you guys heard this story or not, but the Jetta was not in great shape. Matter of fact, it was such in bad shape. Remember with my friend Ish, we used to go to the gym, and I used to carry a hammer in the car. He was like, why are you carrying a hammer in the car? Because I had a bad starter. How many of you guys had a bad starter on your car? So you know what I'm about to say. It may or may not start when you put the key in there. But one way to make it start is you gotta hit the hammer. So I remember at the gym one day, early in the morning, we go to the gym at six o'clock, and I park way in the back. Why, because I want nobody to see me. And two, the car might not start when I get out. So, we get out the gym, I park in the back, this car won't start. And at this point, these guys are terrible. And these guys won't leave. They end, up, they end up parking back there where I'm parked at. And so we're just shooting the crap, sitting outside, and I'm waiting for them to leave, and they will not leave. <laughs> I guess they're gonna find out today. So I get the hammer out of the car, and they're like, what are you doing? I'm about to start my car, guys. So I knock on the starter, jump back in the car, and if you, if you ever had a bad starter, you know not to put the hood all the way down because that, that first tap might not do it. So you put the hood down, put the hammer there, you knock it, get in the car, nothing works. I so say, here we go. So I'm like, ish, knock the hammer right here, knock the hammer. He's knocking the hammer while I'm turning the key, boom, I'm going. And at this point, I, I, I know I needed a change, but I put my last dollar in gas on the way home, because I know I needed a change. And so how many of you guys ever overdraft your bank account? It's all right. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So that, that like $20 worth of gas was 20 plus $35 fee. And so that was it, my card was done. So I said, you know what? Today, when I leave in the gym around eight o'clock, I'm gonna go driving for dollars. And I go driving for dollars for about two days. And I say, you know what, I'm gonna go into a neighborhood I know. I go into the same neighborhood, Salem Woods, the first house we ever went to in North Carolina. Flintfield Drive on the same street I grew up on. There's a house on the corner with bushes, high grass, and I'm thinking to myself, Sean Terry is a genius, this guy. But I'm like, what do I do now? So I remember the podcast. Go back and watch the videos. He said, find the owner. I find the owner. I'll never, you'll never forget. How many of you guys remember your first deal? You'll never forget the people in there. Amy Honeycutt Mitchell. Thank God for that woman. I called her. She answered the phone. I said, are you interested in selling your house? She's like, um... You know, I don't know my husband. I need to talk to my husband, but he works weird hours. He'll be back in a couple days. I'm like, all right, cool. I know it was too good to be true. All right, goodbye. She calls back in 20 minutes and says, yeah, I talked to my husband. What are you willing to pay? And I'm like, I don't know, like $30,000? She's like, how about 35? I'm like, sure, no problem. Now here I am, I got negative $70 in my account. I don't know how in the world I'm gonna get this $30,000, but I know that I trust in Sean Terry at this point in time because he's like the obsessed girl I'm chasing. And so I go back and listen, I go find this terrible one-page contract, misspelling, and for you guys don't know, I'm dyslexic, so spelling is not something that I specialize in, so this contract is terrible. But she signs it, I remember driving to the Waffle House, meet her in the parking lot, signing this contract. If you guys, have you guys ever been to Waffle House, by the way? That's all right, cool, all right, I just wanna make sure you guys know what I'm talking about. So I go to the Waffle House, sign the contract, and I have no idea what I'm doing. I still don't know what I'm doing, but I'm listening to the steps, the instructions that I'm getting. And so I take this contract, I need to go cut the grass. I steal my mom's lawnmower, hitting the starter with the hammer so I can leave the driveway before she looks out the window and see me taking the lawnmower. And I get there, I'm cutting the grass. And while I'm there, I cut the grass, I step back and I take a picture. And I put it on Facebook Marketplace. I'm like, house, 50,000 or 54,000, I can't remember what it was. And I'm like, 
this has got to be crazy. So I start cutting the bushes, the hedges, and then a lady calls me. Hey, um, I see you have a house for sale. I'm like, yeah, come on by. She comes by. She's like, oh, it's too much work. And I'm like, oh, here we go. I don't know what I'm, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Another lady calls me. She says, hey, we just finished our flip in Louisville. My husband's out of town, but he'll be back tomorrow. Can I see it? I'm like, absolutely. I said, the door's unlocked in the back. Actually, it doesn't have a door in the back, so just walk in. <laughs> so the next day, Greg calls me and says, hey, um, I like the house. Do you mind if I take my wife the next day? I'm like, sure. They go, he calls me back. He says, you got a deal. So in three weeks, in four weeks, three weeks studying in four weeks, I make $14,000. Now, if you've ever been broke, I mean, negative, $14,000 feels like you hit the Powerball sign. And I knew that at that point, I, I, I've seen the concept. And so that's why I always say you're one deal away. That deal set me up to make over $800,000 in the next 12 months. And I didn't tell my mom because now the room was like, I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave that area. So that's my story. That's my background from depression to being obsessed with something to then going out and figuring out, getting that one deal. So, you know, I have a question and just be honest, how many millionaires are in this room? Okay. Y'all know who to go rob later. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> so, when I started speaking and started doing this, there's a statistic out there that bothers me and bothers probably a lot of the guys at All In, that only 5% of you, 3% of you in this room, there's over 700 people in here, will leave here and not do what they do. They will not do what they've actually learned. And that's, that's, a, that's crazy to me. You come here, you see example after example after example after example after example of people who look and sound just like you, who are humans just like you, dyslexic, no 2.0 GPA, that can be a millionaire in less than five years. But only three to five percent will actually go out and do it, so that troubled me. And so when I go to events, I don't talk about real estate. Why? Because you've just seen so many people come up here and talk about real estate. The information is already there. So I started to think, how and why do people not leave this event, this beautiful, amazing event, and go home and become millionaires? And I said, there has to be some reason. And so I started to dissect myself and say, well, why wasn't I successful earlier? What was the things inside of me that I needed to change to get there? So, you know, one thing that I would say is we all want to be successful, whether that's thousandaire, millionaire, billionaire, whatever your success defined to you. But one of the things that I learned is that we actually don't think we deserve it. Is that, does that make sense to you? Because I used to pray for a six-figure job just so I can, because I thought six figures was it. And then I used to say, yeah, I want to be a millionaire because it's easy to say in conversation and passing and with your friends, yeah, I want to be a millionaire. You tell yourself you, every day, I want to be a millionaire. But you know what? You actually don't believe you deserve to be a millionaire. And that's something you have to change. So you need to think and believe that you need to be a millionaire. Here's another thing. Most people are not willing to make the sacrifice to be a millionaire. It sounds great, doesn't it? It is stressful, right? A lot of you guys are married, have kids. Let me tell you this. You have to make a sacrifice in order to get where you want to get. You cannot be the perfect dad. You cannot be the perfect mom. You cannot be the perfect husband or wife while you're trying to build something. So for any of you out there think that this is going to be the greatest journey in your life, let me tell you, get ready to make some sacrifices. Talk to your spouse, talk to your children and say, listen, for the next 12 to 18, 24 months, I'm going to be probably mentally absent. 
right? I was talking to my guy Freeland back there. He said, listen, he said he talked to his son. And his son, you know, 12, 10 or 12 years old, he said, Dad, do you love me? He's like, yeah, I love you. And literally, I'm just having this conversation a couple hours ago. He said, well, Dad, if I had a birthday and you had to do something for business at the same day, would you miss my birthday? He says, well, you talking about right now or later? He said, now. He said, son, I will absolutely miss your birthday. He said, why? Because I would rather miss three or four birthdays and spend the next 40 with you. And that's the sacrifice you're going to have to make. So make that sacrifice. So what I didn't tell you is before I got to where I am, I have 12 failed businesses, a dozen. It's no joke. A dozen failed businesses, lawn care, two restaurants, notary company, car lot, wholesale car lot. I could keep going, but I never gave up. But you know why most people are afraid of failure? Not because of the failure for yourself, but what other people think and talk about you when you fail. You don't want to go to the family reunion or the Thanksgiving or the cookout or your friends and talk about that failure that you've had. Most of us are okay with failing if nobody else knew. Right? Most of us, but I used to be the laughing stock of like my family and friends, right? What are you up to now? Yeah? How many of you guys got that? What are you doing now? Right? Like, and so you're afraid of what other people will say to you. Now, I promise I won't keep talking for a long time. We'll do some questions if we can get some microphones about some stuff. And another thing is, most of us already have a million dollars in our brain, but we don't know how to download it and implement it. Does that make sense? Right? So if you have been here for the last two days, Every single person here has learned how to build a multi-million dollar business. Am I right? Yes. Am I right? Yes. But statistics say only 35 of you in this room will actually go out and do something. That's like the first two rows on this side. Everybody else will go home and go back to doing whatever they were doing, which is not chasing your dreams. So you have to understand that what you have absorbed is already going to make you a millionaire. So you have to download it, and then you have to implement it. You heard what Sal said. Systematize it. This is not rocket science. I don't think anybody that came on the stage today or yesterday were geniuses. We're regular people just like you guys. So understand. So when I, when I, I say that I was a millionaire before I had the money, I was a millionaire before I had the actual physical currency, and you are too. So when I started the conversation and said, how many millionaires in this room, I should see more hands. So let's try this again. How many millionaires are in this room? Do you see the difference? It's just, she got two hands up. Do you see the difference? It's all in here. That's all I'm trying to tell you. In order to get where, from where you are to where you want to be, there has to be a change. But if you want to stay over there, keep doing what you're doing. If you want to get over there, because here is, you got to work for somebody else 40, 50 hours a week for the rest of your life, retire at 65, 62, whatever retirement age is, live the rest of your 11, 12 years out, and die. How fun does that sound? Over here, you buying your own airplane, flying yourself where you want to go, taking your family on all the vacations you want, you're employing people, you're giving back to your church, your community, and all these things. That's what you want to do here, but you got to change some shit that you're doing over here. It's real simple, but I know a lot of it's behind smoke and mirrors. It's all here. I am not special. I'm not better than anybody else up here. I just believe I deserve to be successful. And, and let me let you in on a little secret. When you become successful, whatever your definition of successful is, a couple people raise their hand, says they're worth over a million dollars. When you get to that point, 
you start to realize you never actually did this for yourself. I have 19 employees. I am my mother's retirement plan. My brother is my COO. My younger brother works for me. My brother-in-law works for me. I donate hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year to causes that I enjoy. So you don't have to be rich for yourself. Other people need you to be rich. So if you meet anybody in your life that says they just want to be comfortable, get rid of them. Comfortable is for the weak. Other people need you to be rich. It's okay to say you want to be a billionaire. How many people do billionaires employ? Think about that. Think about the charitable causes that Bill and Melinda Gates have done over the years of wealth. So somebody out there needs you to be rich. Don't be, don't be selfish. In the beginning, it's okay to be selfish, but later it leads to selfishness. So you can give everything that you want. And remember, you are already a millionaire. So once again, how many millionaires are in this room? I, I don't know, that's, that, that's not exciting enough for me. How many millionaires are in this room? Exactly, because when you are successful, and here, here's, the, here's the key, and I'm gonna leave with this. When you become successful, it's not about the money, it's about the freedom. The freedom to do whatever, whenever you want, period. So remember that. You gotta get from here to there, but you need to change something in between. And I'm gonna leave you with one last thing. I know it's the last, but I lied. Okay, this is the last thing. How many of you guys have ever heard the story of the bamboo tree? Right? So another gem from Freedom Johnson, you know, I met him a couple years ago and he says, you remind me of a bamboo tree. And I said, why is that? Did you know that the Chinese bamboo tree takes five years to even sprout out of the ground? It has to be watered and fertilized wherever it was planted every single day. For five years, it never comes out of the ground. But once it comes out of the ground, it takes five weeks to grow 90 feet. I don't think you're gonna understand what I just said. It takes five years to grow underground before it ever shows a little head above the surface. So correlate that to your life. When you think that you're down and out and you haven't made it, you're not Ryan Pineda on Instagram, or me on YouTube, or wherever you think it is. You're not driving one of the fancy cars parked out front. Don't forget, you haven't reached that. You're still underground growing. And that's why every single day you have to water and fertilize your mind and your brain. Every single day. Understand that that tree takes water and fertilizer every single day for five years. But in five weeks it grows 90 feet and is one of the strongest trees in the world. So think of yourself as a bamboo tree. You may not have sprouted yet, but you're growing underground very well. And when you come out of the ground, you will explode. And that's what all my past failures were to where you see me are now. It took me five weeks to grow 90 feet. You can do the same thing. So I got a little bit of time left. I can cut it short. And so if you guys have some questions, about anything, real estate, life, whatever it is. I don't even know if you guys have been doing questions, but. Thank you, brother. Any questions? We got a gentleman right there. Hey, all right, so who's got a question? Here we go. How many guests are willing to put it on the line and just answer questions like this? This is phenomenal. Absolutely. In the beginning of your business, in the point of scaling, how did you keep focused and not spread your mind over many things? I've got a lot of stuff going on in my mind, a lot of ideas. Um, I'm looking for an integrator at the moment for my business, but as far as keeping things on track before you found them, how did you kind of keep your momentum in one direction? But and, you know, more than one task at a time, I guess. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, man, because most of us entrepreneurs are just serial entrepreneurs and we have a bunch of ideas that we 
want to implement at once. And that was my problem. You've seen that in my past with the 12 failed businesses, probably doing a couple of them at the same time. But what you have to do, there's this book called The One Thing, and you need to really focus on the one thing in order to get where you are. Because me focusing on real estate got me to where I could invest and buy. I've, I'm invested in nine other businesses at this point, right? And so you have to focus and do every step yourself first. And that's the important thing. For me, I was a one-man band for a long time, pulling out two, three, four, five deals a month before I started to hand things off. And so what happens is, and I'm sure these guys have spoken about it, but for me, you focus on doing everything in your business first because you have to know what it is before you start handing it off. Now, I understand you're not an integrator, but I'm not really either. Alex is a great integrator, but sometimes we can play both sides of the coin. So as an entrepreneur in the beginning, you're going to have to buckle down and be that integrator so that you can quickly pass that off to somebody else that is stronger and better at that position than you are. The common things about fire yourself quickly. Well, any non-revenue generated activities that you want to hand off, you need to do those as quickly as possible. But it's important because I was in here for Sal to create systems. And when you document your process and create SOPs, it becomes very easy to then hand that task off to someone else so they can pick up and run as if they were you. I hope that answered your question. Hey, Max, it's been much for a while. Uh, just want to thank you. And, uh, I was saying, thank you for you to change my life a lot, just watching your content. And I've heard your story a lot, um, you know, from when you first were staying in your brother's uh, house. And I've always had this question, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of just curious, how did you turn that 12000 into 800000 in that first year? I kept going. I was one deal away. So then I became obsessed. Right, so a lot of people say they want the success and this, but I literally became obsessed. I knew the probate process in my county where to the point where I can give one of the, the, the ladies working there a day off. I knew everything about the tax and the way we did foreclosures in my county. I literally became obsessed. I'm talking day and night, I understood the system. And believe it or not, most of you guys are just getting in this business over the last couple years. These tools and all these things that we have, they really weren't even around back then. When I started in like 16, 17, like skip tracing was like a dollar 50, right? And, and you, were, you were mailing because there was no way to get good phone numbers. So you gotta take advantage, one, of the technology that you have now, but two, you really need to understand what's going on with the, a, a probate list or a probate prospect. Understand how that system works in your county from front to end because the earlier, the way I, the way I say it, if, if I'm a specialized foot doctor and I deal with pa patients that have cancer in their foot, if I'm able to detect it early as possible, that means my success rate goes up and I become the best foot doctor in the world because I have created the process and I know how cancer forms and the cancer is the problem that your person's having. I know the steps and where it travels as it goes down. So become very obsessed with the, the process, not just how to pull a list and how to call, but understand why you're, why you're calling this person or how this probate got right here and how it started here and what are the processes because the early I can detect the problem, my success rate goes up. Hope that makes sense. Looks like we have one way in the back. Yeah, yeah, so I appreciate your time over here. I'm from Maryland. Um, my name is Ayo DJ Abraham. I've never done wholesaling before, but I have a lot of friends uh, that are doing it very successfully, and I'm just very interested in myself. I'm not really in the real estate space at all. I mainly do e-commerce. Uh, but I wanted to see, like, what would you suggest would be, like, a good way to find the first deal? Like, would you have any personal suggestions? anything like that? You know, I, th I think, one, it goes back to some of the same things I said before, and it's like becoming obsessed. And the guys from All In can teach you from the beginning all the way to scaling your business to multi-million. And so if you're, if you're not sure where to start, start with listening to podcasts and the free content to just get an idea so you can even ask the right questions when you hire a mentor or a coach or decide to take this journey alone on your own. But like I said, you've seen multiple people walk on this stage that have successful wholesaling business and you can do the same thing. All you gotta do is dedicate yourself. Believe that you, know, you can be successful. Yes? Is this on? Okay. Hi, um, so I'm an acquisitions manager and I really do wanna be loyal um, you know, to my boss and all, but I really want to make money fast for my family. So I want to know, do you think it's better to be loyal and stick with him, or should 
So if you remember me saying, one of the greatest things I've ever learned from the United States Air Force was integrity first. And so everything can be solved with communication. And so if you have your aspiration, to spill them out on the table. Now, keep in mind, you're going to be very vulnerable at this point because you can walk out of that place without a job if you ask th those questions. But you should be honest. And so if you legally can go out and create your own income and you have a conversation with your boss, that is kind of a personal question. Um, if the entrepreneur spirit is burning you, there's nothing you, I, or anybody else can do to stop that. So just have an open communication with the person you work for and see what they can offer you. And maybe, maybe they can keep you and you know, allow you to, to build within before you leave. So take the time and, and, and just have a communication with, with the person you work for. Where, where are we at? Oh, yes. Hey, Max, how's it going? My name is Brandon. I'm a 20-year-old from Miami. I just learned about this business, and I'm ready to go all in. Um, I have family depending on me, so I have no option but to win. What advice would you give a 20-year-old? I, I think the best guy to answer that question at 20 would be Alex, right? I mean, Alex is a prime example of somebody that started at a young age. But I know it sounds corny, man, but we always talk about the why. Right? And your why is very important. And so for me, think about that same family you talked about. Imagine if somebody came to the house and kidnapped them and said, you got 24 hours to bring me a wholesale deal or I'm going to kill your family. Sounds pretty extreme, doesn't it? Put yourself under those same pressures and you'll find that. So if your family really means that much to you and what you're saying is really true, the reason why you want to do this, then you'll do it. There's nothing I can say to motivate you or to keep you going, you, you got to want it. It's got to come from within. Yes, sir. I'll do uh, two more questions, and I'll save some time for the guys. Ten more, ten, ten, ten more minutes. I got ten more minutes. How you doing, sir? You know, I get that question a lot, and I, I'm going to refer to Alex again, but this guy, is, he's there with that stuff. Me, I'm, I'm a workaholic junkie, right? I go to bed at 10 p.m., and I wake up at 4.30, and I go hard all day long. So my ritual is just work hard, and I ain't stopped working hard since 2015. And so I do do something now that is probably a little, I don't know. All I, what I do is I work 21 days straight and I take seven days off. Monday, Sunday, doesn't matter. So I work 21 days straight and I take seven days off so I can get back to that point. So you gotta work hard every single day. And I don't have any morning rituals, but I'm sure, I know Alex had to do some kumbaya. Did he do kumbaya on the stage when you got? See, that's probably, pro yeah, see he does that kumbaya stuff. I'm, I'm, I don't even know how to meditate. Hey Max, how are you? Doing well. So you kind of talked about in the beginning when you're starting out, you have to be a little bit more selfish. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of contradictory to the saying that what your why is your family. Mm -hmm. so, for, so at this point, I have I just closed a deal, my second one, like yesterday, and I. <laughs> and what I what I want what I was gonna do with it was kind of help out my family with it, even though it's only like a $20, $200 deal, but I don't really know how to like go about it, especially like, do I help out with my family or should I invest that and then go like think about it five, just five to 10 years down the road and then help them out with a bigger, I don't know, bigger ventures. You know, those are always difficult questions to answer. I'm assuming you took a flight to Arizona. Is that, is that true? No, I drove, drove here from Vegas. Drove from Vegas, okay. Um, well, the last time you were on a flight, you, they had a safety briefing prior to taking off, right? And that safety briefing says that in the event of an emergency, if cabin pressure is lost, oxygen mass will drop from the ceiling, right? So right now you lost cabin pressure in your life. 
right? It says, even though the bag does not look inflated, oxygen is still flowing. That's called hope, right? And it says, before you put on anyone else's mask, even the person beside you, even if it's a child, make sure that your mask is secured yourself. There's no reason for both of us to be dead, right? So take care of your business so that you see a long-term picture. You need to reinvest that, that small check of $2,200 back into the business so it can snowball into something else. Personally, that's what I would do. I know some, listen, every time you make a check, there will be a problem from somebody. I'm just gonna tell you that right now. There's always gonna be a bill that somebody has that needs to be paid every time you make a check. But if you're truly doing this for your family, it is very true. Sal and I say the same thing. You have to be selfish in order to be selfless. And it's gonna take some, they're not gonna understand it. Trust me, you can ask my brother over there, my mom. They, I, there's been so many holidays that I've missed, but now I get to do every single holiday whenever I want to in the grandest style. So think long-term and, and do what you can, but reinvest the money back into your business. Awesome. Yeah. We got limited, so let's Absolutely. Hey, so I just wanted to say that uh, this guy right here, Max Maxwell, I don't know anything about him. I just asked my friend, hey, is he a wholesaler? So apparently, I'm probably the last person in the room that knows who he is. However, I do know one thing about Max. Max, I don't know if you remember this, but we just met in Atlanta. Okay. And there was a young person that actually had her sister drive her 40 miles away. And she said, well, Helio, I'm here to meet one person and one person only. I don't know you. I went backstage with Maya and Kayani and Brittany, Brittany introduced yeah. right I remember the young, the young lady, yes. Exactly. And I just want to say, look, I don't know anything about Max. I just find that he's a wholesaler. I know nothing about wholesaling. I'm a backyard home builder. But I do know that this guy is one classy guy. Because an 18 year old literally drove, I mean, I'm sorry, had, his, had, his sister, had her sister drive her to the event that Max was headlining in Atlanta, Georgia. And she said, I'm shy. And what did you say, Max, to her? To build her up. I don't, I don't remember, to be honest. You said, guess what? I am shy too. That is true. You broke the ice, and then you spoke to her, right? And you literally calmed her down. So on behalf of Maya, from Atlanta, Georgia, I just want to say, Max, you are one class of dude. Whatever. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, one more. Thank you, brother. You made my night, man. Hey, what's up? My name is John from uh, San Angelo, Texas. Man, I just wanted to say the first time I heard of you, I was sleeping on an air mattress with my wife at her mother's house. Wow. I came across one of your videos, you saying that you bought a lot for $250. And that sent me down the rabbit hole, man. <laughs> I was like, who is this guy talking about? I can buy a property with no money. What's he talking about? Digging deeper and deeper and deeper, and then I, I found Brian and Reagan. And then I was like, man, these guys know what they're talking about, right? And so I was like, I'm gonna put it to test. So I started going around town, and then I actually got a couple of contracts that fell through. But those contracts made this lady, uh, it showed me that everything was possible. Everything that you were saying was possible. And then eventually, I finally went over the $10,000 in the morning. Congratulations, man. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, guys. Love you. Thanks, bro. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you having me, man. man I appreciate you always doing a thing, brother. Appreciate you. Thank you, brother. You're not doing no presentation, man. Appreciate it. Thank you.